And now we're live. All right. Always takes a second before it uh, starts showing up. Uh, realize it also takes a little bit before uh, viewers start showing up. Um, so, uh, but I will start off by saying we have a uh, great stream uh, to talk about a bunch of propaganda stuff. Uh, just watching the viewer count, waiting for uh, for it to actually say that we have anyone showing up. <laughs> um, anybody in the uh, chat sound off so we know that we've got that there's uh, actually people here yet? Shared it on Twitter and everything, but uh, we were like a minute late. I don't know what I've been told. Propaganda's really old. Sound off. One, two. <laughs> oh, only two viewers? That's pathetic. Three. There we go. Uh, got Dan in there. Um, all right. So that's a, that's a, a few already. Um, I should not be previewing this. I can see it in front of me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. So first of all, I'll be drinking... The uh, Founders Dirty Bastard today, uh, which I believe is actually also high alcohol content. Uh, it's 8.5. That's high, but not too much. Yesterday I was drinking uh, 12%. <laughs> um, and, then, and then meanwhile, for me, I had one of those, oh, I'm an adult and my taste buds are changing moments where I didn't like orange juice growing up. But then just randomly I had some I'm like, what the what the fuck? This is great now. <laughs> and so now, so literally, like all I've been drinking for the past like three days are just variations of orange juice. Huh. I had so a. I used to hate this now I don't. I had a similar thing happen when I, uh, when I switched to, uh, uh, like non sugary soda, like diet sodas and that, or um, those little packets that you could get for water bottles and that, um, and like. That completely changed how what I like in terms of like sugary things. So like I don't really like overly sugary things now. It's weird. Yeah. I also like uh, I used to hate ice in anything. Um, I still never get ice in anything. If the drink's not cold when it comes out, I probably wouldn't want to drink it anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, but stopping having sugary things made a uh, huge difference in that as well. Like I, I now use ice yeah. um, because it's the, that it was the ice was watering it down, but um, you know, now I'm not worried about st stuff being watered down. <laughs> George is instantly like, Oh, you mean like cores or uh, cores light or bud light? Ah, <laughs> I don't want my beer watered down. No. <laughs> oh wait, that was uh. Um. So, anyways, let's uh get on the actual topic. Um, we thus far we've been going through and watching a bunch of uh propaganda films chronologically. As we've been going through, we've been kind of uh, um, observing how propaganda has changed over time and kind of learning what that means. The eventual goal is to take a bunch of this and clip it together, uh, uh, cut it together into a bunch of clips, and you know have some voiceover in that and make a large episode about you know the history of propaganda um, as viewed for through a few films. Um, Thus far, we we started off uh, and uh, interrupt me anytime, uh, Tiger Star, if you want. Um, the uh, thus far we have uh, uh, viewed three films. Ooh, there we go, <laughs> three films. Uh, uh, two that kind of showed like the early version of propaganda. To understand the larger story of propaganda, you have to know that like it really didn't start until World War one 
Um, and the term propaganda wasn't even coined until the 1930s by Edward Bernays, uh, or John Bernays, something like that. Ber Ber somebody named Bernays, <laughs> the uh, nephew of of uh, cigar chomping guy, um, the psycho uh, Freud. Uh, Freud, thank you. Um, the nephew of Freud. So uh, pretty good at understanding uh, the meaning of it. And he was also kind of like the progenitor of, uh, of advertising, of business advertising. Uh, obviously, there had been advertising long before, but the idea of actually like putting uh, theory and psychology behind it is a very 20th century creation. So after World War One is... Uh, when you can finally start seeing like some real propaganda uh, outside of the military. Um, and that's why the first one we started off with was uh, um, Bolshevism on Trial, a 1919 film based off of a, uh, a Dixon novel. Dixon being the same guy who, who uh, wrote uh, Birth of a Nation. Um, but unlike Birth of a Nation, that wasn't propaganda, but uh the uh uh bolshevism on trial was propaganda because it's also depends on who is behind it it's not just that it's media we dislike or something along those lines and in fact by the end of this we actually really like some of this propaganda um but it's about even if for ironic reasons Oh uh, yeah, I mean, Reefer Madness is definitely for ironic reasons. <laughs> that Protect was... the children from the giggle leaf. <laughs> um, but that gets us to the second film w that we watched, which was Reefer Madness, and it showed that, um, you know, competence in in propaganda was still not there in the 1930s that movie came out in the uh mid to late 1930s i'm not remembering the exact date uh although i have it right here uh 1936 and um that meant oh and jertra said take a swig jertra so uh it showed how propaganda was progressing though it was becoming an industry and so last time we watched um, Why We Fight, what I consider to be kind of the apotheosis of propaganda. The first time that we see, you know, all these different strains, you know, the, the psychology of it, the cinema, uh, cinematography of it, the storytelling of it, all coming together into uh, basically a bunch of news clips uh, that uh, had been gathered by Hollywood throughout the uh, throughout the 1930s and early 40s to, well, argue why we fight during World War II. It was a series of short, uh, not really short films, but kind of documentaries that came out um, from 1942 to 1945 and um, really showed like the the uh, the chops of of storytelling, cinematography. Um, the actual like intended effect behind it, you know, uh, the the propagandizing part of it, um, and it was pretty entertaining too. Uh, you know, it gets stuff wrong, of course, and it's it's propaganda and it's World War Two, um, but this was like the best, and it changed Hollywood forever to the point that like we still see so many references to why we fight in like it, you, like you cannot find a single um uh tarantino movie that doesn't make direct reference to those films it's in every single one of his films um at least that i've seen i don't know if i've seen every single one of his films but i think i've seen uh, i think i've seen all of them <laughs> trying to uh, imagine why we fight but in django unchained what a weird mix that would be Oh, it's the intro. Uh, it's the intro narrative. The sh ah. the shooting on time with the uh, with the you know the literal bullet points. Huh. Yeah, that's in Django Unchained. That's a direct reference to uh, why we fight. Um, it's it's really hard to to um, to point to a film that hasn't been affected by why we fight. It it changed Hollywood forever. Um, 
you know, it basically took all that Citizen Kane stuff, all the uh, all the weird German impressionism and German propaganda, um, as well as all the uh, you know nineteen twenties and early thirties Soviet stuff, uh, Soviet realism, and um, and put it all together into this one package that Hollywood has never really gotten out of using. Um, so, um, in terms of all that, what, uh, am I missing anything that, um, is pertinent to, uh, the history so far? Cause we're going right into 1946 after this. Mm, no, see, I'd say you got uh, about sums all of it. Cool. Um, so that's uh, that's where we left off world war ii really show uh, really showing how propaganda can be but uh today we're starting right off with a film from uh, i think 1946 uh, i don't have the date i think uh, it's 1945 1946 i think 1947 um which is called Don't Be a Sucker. And let's put it up. There we go. And uh, you can find this on the National Archives. We know for sure that this is propaganda because it comes directly from the U.S. Army. <laughs> but, uh, Star, this is one of your favorites, so uh, you want to introduce it? Yeah, so this is the most based propaganda ever made, If I, in my personal opinion. Basically, the whole propaganda, um, even though it's after the war, because you'd think after the war they would get right into more anti-Soviet or anti-communist propaganda, but uh, th this is basically like, hey, that whole fascist thing that happened in Italy and Germany, let's not have that happen again, and it could happen anywhere, even here. And here are the signs. And it, it, in my opinion, like, uh, it surprisingly holds up well. Like, yeah, you've got, like, a bit of, like, the um, old-fashioned dialogue and uh, sometimes, like, like, there are some areas where, like, like, there's a bit where they talk about, like, freedom of religion, but then they only show, like, two, <laughs> you know? And it's, uh, it's Christianity and Judaism. Yeah, maybe they show a Catholic church too, but you know, whatever that doesn't count. Is still Christianity. It, it is, but you know, there's the there's like the old fashioned attitude of like, oh no, one one of them is the heretic and the other is the true Christianity or whatever. But mm. you know, um, point being, you know, like yeah, there there are some things where like you know, it, it's like a little cynical, like it's like yeah, like diversity is one of our strengths, even though Jim Crow is going on at this time. Well, I but, mean, that's the least, same thing we saw with Why We Fight, right? And that was in 1942. Of course. There was this at least, weird like, emphasis on religion, but it was very much a, you know, look at us, we're all allies joined together to fight the Nazis. Yeah. It's yeah. like there, there's enough, like, cynicism to poke holes in it, and of course it's a hokey newsreel, but, like, in terms of, like, A, like, what causes the rise of fascism and B, like, just the general, like, like the spirit of the message. Like, if the message, like, you know, it's in a vacuum, you ignore who's delivering it cynically, um, I, I think it still holds up really well. Yeah. yeah. I remember when this got really popular right after uh, Trump got elected and people were going, like, see? Yeah, see, like, per perfect example. Like, the fact that, um, you know, whether it was uh, disingenuous or genuous or whatever, the fact that people were able to so easily make a comparison – and like see the point in that comparison shows how well it's held up, even though it's been over 60, 70 years at this point. Mm -hmm. So are we ready? Absolutely. Let's head into it. And uh, please sound off, guys, if the volume is too loud, too quiet, all that kind of stuff. I can change it here.
This looks like a fake, doesn't it? Well, it is a fake. Wrestling is a fellow who's willing to bet his heart. <laughs> Was this like actual like professional wrestling kind of thing? Or like, what is this starting off with? <laughs> well, so so this propaganda series like illustrates examples of being a sucker. And the first example they're giving is like a uh, a rigged sporting match, where like if you watch it, it's so obvious that you know everyone involved is faking and the outcome is already predetermined. But a sucker is like, oh gee, look, I could make some money betting on this sport event. Oh, you know, or, or, I see. You know, like, like that sort of thing. You're you're gonna see that. You're gonna see like gambling and then like getting robbed. You know, like like very various things like that. Like these are things that suckers do. But and you want to know what the biggest suckers of all were? The people who fell victim to fascism. And, you know. And it, Haybot is saying it's a little bit loud, so I'll turn it down a little bit. Let me know if it's uh, still too loud, guys. Yeah. Basically, um, uh, not only the idea of like what a sucker does, but also the fact that just as the people bringing the sports match are trying to take away your money. And that the people who rob you are trying to take away your money. Fascists are trying to take something valuable away from you, too. Mm. Your freedom! But they're not saying that fascists are grifters. They're saying that fascists are trying to take, like, your freedom. Yeah. But, but it's the fact that they're playing a sucker's game. Mm. And that you need to be careful or you will be suckered out of your money or your freedom or whatever. All right. Yeah. Earn money on it. Henry here got on the train with two hundred dollars. He couldn't see any harm in a friendly game of cards. What if the other men were strangers? And take Joe Collins. He's got a nice wife at home. But he met this girl at the bar, and she looked kind of cute after the first couple of drinks. <laughs> Did he just diss that lady's looks? <laughs> either either that or he dissed his constitution, I suppose. <laughs> Pistol whip! <laughs> Dang, dropped like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> Ah, Jesus, it's the fives. <laughs> There's a good old-fashioned word for people like this. We call them suckers. And there are other people. People who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. There are all kinds of games and all kinds of suckers. Take Mike here, for instance. He's got everything, you might say. He's young, he's healthy. He's got a job. And he's got a country called America. America. A wonderful thing to have. America. America. Lots of room. Room enough to raise plenty of food. Big factories to make things a man can yeah, use. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta put the propaganda somewhere. Big cities somewhere. to do the business of a big <laughs> country. And people. Lots of people. Enough to work the farm and build the factories. Dig the mines run the business Work all kinds of people people from <laughs> different countries with different religions different colored skins free people they can live together and work together Take that, and build Jackie america Robinson. together he got there because first. they're free <laughs> free to vote to say what they please go to their own churches to pick their own jobs they did show a Catholic church. Yeah. Mike's yep. got something, all right. He's got America. Thank you, George Wallace. Or not George Wallace. Tim <laughs> Wallace. Ron Wallace! Guys who stayed up nights <laughs> figuring out how to take that away from him. I want to give you the truth, folks. The truth about America. I know you've got a lot of questions. You want to know why you're not getting the breaks you deserve? Well, I'm not a politician. But I've made it my business to study these things, and I happen to know the facts. See, like, pause, pause it real quick. I'm just an average American. 
So like that, that right there is one thing that really holds it up really well. Yeah, you don't have people standing on soapboxes anymore. That's a little outdated. But the fact that the people spreading these ideas are using the exact same talking points that people recently do. Hey, I'm not a part of the government or the establishment or whatever. I did my own research. I'll tell you the real facts that they don't want you to know. Why don't you subscribe to my whatever the hell? You know? <laughs> so even though it's like an older form of doing that, like it still translates very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it also is like kind of showing how uh, how you know random people just happen upon a lot of this stuff and may not even know that they uh, that they're you know being suckered. Yeah, because you know it. it it's literally depicted as a random man on the street gathering a crowd and people just going, oh, man, this is interesting. And you could see the same thing happening with, like, Alex Jones. I mean, it's, like, literally, you know, mm -hmm. people just kind of going, like, wow, this guy's kind of wacky. <laughs> let's let's watch him. And then, you know, the more they watch him, the more they, they get sucked in. Um, so let's uh, keep going. This is great. But I'm an American, American, and some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign accents making all the money. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. This fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Yes, he knows our rights. What's the Brought answer? You by Sinclair Lewis. What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Now, friends, these books are free. Hey I'll point out that that just seems to be directly referencing, like, um, uh, crud, what's it called? Um, this the first uh conservative coalition from like the 1930s the big like anti new deal group For, is it literally just called the conservative coalition I, i'll bet I'm you i'm not sure um hold on um anti new deal coalition The Conservative Coalition, yeah. Um, which, uh, to give you a a uh, a understanding of of who these people were, the first member listed on the Wikipedia is Harry Bird, the uh, arch uh, segregationist. So yeah. <laughs> But uh, you know, you you get uh, you get a lot of this kind of like, um, it, it especially in the further right wing conservative stuff, where uh, they're very explicitly uh, you know you know just anti everything Biden or anything like that. Um, you know, even when he's being quite right wing, um, the. Uh, you see the same kind of thing where they start seeking explanations for uh, for you know why the U.S. is so bad, and inevitably it comes down to uh, black people and foreigners, you know. Or uh, now it's they uh, took their jobs. There's yeah, there's that for the you know the crisis on the southern border, or scapegoating uh, the other. Or Black Lives Matter is ruining everything and all that kind of stuff for the woke agenda. And it's always that kind of thing. Um, and it, it's always this reactionary stance. This is uh, There's a long history in the U.S. Of, of these kinds of reactionary beliefs. But I think that pamphlet that he's handing out sounds an awful lot like a uh, conservative coalition pamphlet. So or like army. other famous racist and or anti-Semitic pamphlets that were commonly passed around. At this yeah, time. I'm more saying it sounds directly referencing it. 
That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. You it, can also make comparisons to like the KKK too. The fact that they specifically oh, yeah. mentioned black people and Catholics. Yep. And foreigners. Uh, yeah. Big, big anti-immigration stuff. I mean, there's a reason why we had the uh, Emergency Quota Act of 1921 and the uh, and the Quota Act of 1924, which uh, basically l limited immigration to such an extent that it was the most limited um, amount of immigration we would ever have, all the way until it was repealed in 1965. Um, that's often why we talk about like Asians as being a model minority because only uh, Asians of a per of like a particular profession or uh, or um, uh, credentialing, you know, uh, degrees, having particular amount of education were allowed into the country. That obviously creates a model minority. Um, so you know that that kind of thing is we still have lingering effects of this racism. Um, and it was very, uh, the KKK was very much involved in pushing for that. Oh, yeah. All right. Paid for by real Americans who want others to know the truth. Excuse me, young man, but are you actually going to read that stuff? Sure, why not? You heard what he said. Didn't you? Yes, I heard. But do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. It makes pretty good sense to me. I'm speaking to you as an American American. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes. Without alien foreigners. Without Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know these people... What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. <laughs> hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that's when and that it matters. Doesn't it? <laughs> these are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them, you know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Yes, boy. Thank you. <laughs> before he said Masons, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about, what about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people, all of us. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course... That and I'd like to point out, this isn't just like a... Uh, uh, you know, a reductio ad Hitlerum or anything. Also, yeah. there's hail outside, so let me know if it's bleeding into my mic. Um, Not hearing anything so far. Yeah. But it's, like, but it's also freaking like, out my uh, cat a little bit. He's sitting there going like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, but like, also like what he's explaining, what he's explaining in this part, like I appreciate how it's not just, uh, you know, he's not just making it as simple as like, uh, diversity good and hating diversity bad like he's actually taking his time to explain like no this isn't even about like whether it's good or bad it's the fact that the nazis are specifically using it as a weapon to divide the nation up like he's putting it in more practical terms yeah that kind of eliminates the barrier between like whether a trait is good or bad that seems to bog down a lot of these discussions yeah and it's also like you know the uh, I think it was Umber uh, Umberto Eco who coined the term "ur fascism," um, which one of the key things about it is that that kind of reactionary uh, nationalism, where it's you know, I'm the true American trying to revive the true American, and you know all these other people are getting in the way. Um, 
you know, that they can't, the, these other people are the things stopping us from being great. Um, and, uh, you know, that is literally what, what Nazis did to, to gain power was to, um, to demonize Jews, communists, socialists, uh, you know, even liberals, um, you'd find, uh, especially in the uh, late twenties, you'd find Hitler, uh, just bashing on liberals, um, even though they'd often be pretty sympathetic to him. Um, and, uh, the, uh, but basically anything left of center, um, was, you know, this, this evil thing that had to be, uh, removed, um, even if it wasn't actually left of center. Um, the, uh, you know, the point was we have some, uh, some great national history that we need to revive and these people are in the way. Um, so it's not just a, a everything I dislike is Nazi uh, stuff. This is like very clear and to the point and much better than B Umberto Eco. I'll say that. <laughs> He's yeah. not clear at all. <laughs> that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us. Made by someone who wants something. Thanks. Remember that when you hear Hold on, I didn't I didn't hear that. Although I saw uh, Tyler in the in the comments wanted to point out I didn't hear a mention of gay people. It's like, well, remember this is nineteen forty seven, so you know uh, gay people are still very much demonized, and they um, and they're first acknowledged as predators anyway, so it probably wouldn't have like, yeah, yeah, uh, wouldn't have it, been a good strategy at the time. Yeah, not not uh, not something you as uh, as uh, Tyler says, uh, not something you want to put at the center of a hate campaign yet. Um, yeah. In fact, this is right at the beginning of the Lavender Scare. So, yeah, definitely not something they want to put in this. But I didn't hear what he had just said. Human beings are not born with prejudices. Always no. they are made for us. Mm -hmm. Made by someone who wants something. Thanks. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. I saw it first in Berlin in 1932. Five young men that I knew were standing in the crowd listening to the Nazi speaker. Eric was a Catholic. Anton, a student of mine, was a Jew. Heinrich owned a small hardware store. Karl was a farmer. And Hans was an unemployed metal worker. To all true Aryan Germans, I say it is time you inherited the nation which rightfully belongs to you. To you alone belongs the glorious destiny of the greater Germany. The Nazi party will provide land for the farmer, work for the worker, and profits for the small businessman. Who is getting these things now? The Jew. The Jew who has stolen our nation and our birthright. Who makes all the money and takes all our jobs? <laughs> the Jew! He must be shunned! He must be ostracized! He must be eliminated! And the Catholics? We don't want our great nation run by a foreign church. We Germans will know what to do with these people when the time comes. They and their faith must be destroyed! Then there are the Freemasons. In Germany, we have no place for secret societies. There will be only one society, and that is the Nazi party. There will be no secrecy about that in the new greater Germany. One by one, he attacked each minority, and he split them off one from the other. These men were all fellow Germans when they came here today. Now they were split into rival groups, suspicious of each other, hating each other. They were being swindled, all of them. But the 
I would like to point out that Nazi rhetoric did not really focus on uh, anti-Catholicism. After all, Hitler himself was a Catholic, so no. <laughs> the, there were, yeah, like not as the main thing. There were some people in the party who like had oh, yeah. schemes, but like, yeah. Yeah, um, it wasn't a primary part of the of uh, Nazi rhetoric. But, you know, the, this is propaganda, yeah. so, you know, that's kind of the point. <laughs> and I also... I also really appreciate because I, I think like um, uh, for many reasons, like when you hear the word minority, you think of like, you know, racial minority or ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. But I think it's easy to forget that minority could be any demographic feature, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's like, you know, because like Freemasons, sure, they're a minority. Most people aren't Freemasons, a certain eye color, a certain anything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that it's... Um, and Freemasons absolutely were attacked by uh, the Nazi party. Oh, yeah. And, um, and uh, it's it's useful that, like, the fact that he's saying, like, he attacked every minority, and it wasn't just, oh, here's a Jew here, here's a Jew there, here's a, a Roma there. Like, it's a fact that he's like, no, no, don't think you're safe just because, you know, you're not a different, like, language or ethnicity or race than Germany. You could still be a minority in this way in that way mm -hmm. it you know it really adds to the you know i always remember it, the because the uh, another thing to point out catholics aren't a minority in in uh germany true um although didn't we look this up it said they were they they became a majority later on oh, or something like no, that no yeah that's right uh at this time they weren't a majority but now they're a majority because more protestants, protestants have, uh, have left become the atheists faith. than yeah. catholics yeah yeah um but the uh but in either case it's it's kind of weird to because it was very much a like american thing to be anti-catholic uh well it's also a very british thing um you know the uh uh, Catholics weren't allowed to hold office in Parliament until uh, like 1850 or something like that. Um, interestingly enough, guess what other religious group wasn't allowed to hold office uh, hold uh, office in Britain until that time? Might it be Judaism? Uh, no, Ju uh, Judaism was allowed in the 1830s. Oh yeah, that's um, right, Disraeli. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was actually special exceptions for for certain ones prior to that, that Parliament could, like, seat them if they got elected, but Parliament had to choose to seat them. Um, but no, it, there was a very, uh, uh, one that was very prominent in the United States. In fact, Thomas Jefferson had said that uh, it would be the next great American religion. You know what it is? What? Unitarianism? Yep. Of course. Yeah, hey, I, I grew up as a <laughs> UU, so I have to bring it in somehow. <laughs> but uh, UUs were, uh, well, not UUs. UUs weren't formed yet. Uh, that but, should be like your chant. Like, UU, UU. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they, were, uh, they were persecuted during the Holocaust. Um, so there, there was a very minor amount of them, but there was an entire... Um, group uh, in uh, in um, in uh, uh, not Bavaria, uh, just north of Bavaria, not Prussia. The other one that's that's to the eastern side. Either way, uh, there was a whole group of them um, who. Th uh, well, there's Thuringia. There's Saxony. Saxony is isn't isn't Saxony well, west? Uh, well, there's two Saxonies. Um, there's the there's Saxony, which is like north of the Czech Republic, right below Prussia, and then uh, what we used to be called Hanover is now called Lower Saxony. Hanover, Hanoverian. Uh, so uh, yeah, they're called uh, they're called uh, Hanoverian Unitarians, um, um, and yeah, that they were specifically prosecuted under the Nazi regime as well. Um, so there were uh, Christian minorities that were prosecuted um, by Nazis, just not Catholics. I, I shouldn't say prosecuted, persecuted. 
<laughs> um, but uh, and yes, Tyler, uh, Unitarians openly opposed them. Uh, that was uh, Unitarians have always been kind of left wing, and after all, they're the first to have performed any gay marriage in the U.S. I was part of uh, doing civil unions prior to that. Anyways. The man who was really being fooled was Hans. He was pure German, according to Nazi standards. To him, they promised everything, and he fell for it. You who are true Aryan Germans will share the glorious destiny of our fatherland. You are the pure-blooded, the master race. It is your divine right to rule, and the Nazi party stands ready to put you into power. It is for you to command all Germany and someday the entire world. That's how Hans became a superman. They gave him a uniform and they pumped up his ego. He wasn't just a little fellow out of work anymore. He was a member of the master race. See, that's another... I couldn't quite understand. That's such another like important detailed ad that is like surprisingly profound. Uh, at this time, because usually, like, it, this is the type of thing you'd expect to hear in, like, modern Twitter discourse or something like that, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, or, yeah. or, 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 like, in a university classroom or something, like, mm -hmm. the fact is sort of like, hey, you're going to feel great for a little bit, they're going to pump your ego, that's the whole point, like, the mm -hmm. fact that, like, you know, they understood, like, how much of a that, powerful factor that was. That white supremacy, you know, supports, uh, seems to help white people, but Ultimately, it ends up hurting everyone, including white people. Yeah, like, like, like what's that? Uh, it was that quote from, like, LBJ where, like, he was asked, like, why so many poor white people supported Jim Crow. And he, he said something to the effect of, like, well, it's simple. If you make the poorest white person feel better than the richest black man, then he'll feel like he's on top of the world. He'll be able to ignore all yeah. these other problems as long as he feels like that he's on top, at least on top of someone else. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm working on editing a video that's about the uh, social construction of race or racialization for short. <clears throat> and one of the key takeaways is that, um, you know, the, the invention of white people is essentially to, uh, to separate uh, laborers you know, separate indentured servants from slaves, from uh, from you know, um, small uh, yeomen. That's it. From yeomen, um, and basically re-register power into the uh, into the planter aristocracy. Like white people, as a concept, were defined by uh, by slavery. Um, and it's largely because of Bacon's rebellion in in uh, 1678. So, um, like the first time you ever see white people as a concept even used in law, the first time ever uh, is in 1681 Maryland. So just three years after the uh, after the Bacon's rebellion. And even then, the club had to grow at first. All right, we'll let the swarthy Germans in, and then they're like, "All right, uh, actually, we'll." Actually, we'll... what's in, weird about that is it is that like the term "swarthy," for instance, is such a weird one that comes from uh from like uh mid nineteenth century uh divisions because it, throughout the nineteenth century, I, I feel like I'm repeating this episode, and we shouldn't do this, but uh it. it the concept of white or Caucasian got split into four or five, depending on how you define it. And, you know, then there were well, like Celts even, and Siamese. Well, even earlier than that, like there, even earlier than that, there's like a letter from like, uh, it was like Benjamin Franklin, where like, you know, it was a typical like, oh, all these German yeah. immigrants. And he they used the term swarthy. Our, uh, uh, but, you know, well, he used the term complexion. Well, yeah. But point is, it's like, you know, even like, you know, white people as we know it today was different back then. It basically was just, ang we say white, but we really mean Anglo-Saxons. And they're yeah. like, all right, we'll include the other like Germans and the French. And they're like, all right, we'll include the Irish, I guess. 
Yeah. Okay, we'll include the Mediterranean people. Maybe depends well, on our mood, you know. Well, what's it kept, weird, you know, growing. What's weird is that it is that. Um, so, what you're pointing out there is an older form of racialization that fu functioned to to differentiate between language. So it was the linguistic differentiation as race. Um, that was uh, one of those holdovers from the Spanish, which is where we got a lot of our racialization in the first place. Um, and I, I mean, I could go on for for literal hours as I have in this episode, um, but uh, well, it, we're getting distracted from the point. The thing is, is that uh, race as a concept was created largely to uh to um you know keep like lower class whites in their place like it was it was racist uh, it specifically harmed people who were defined as other uh, as other from the uh, majority uh, the majority or whatever uh, the most powerful race the master race or whatever um but it was ultimately to keep members of that so-called master race um, in check. Like the documentary says, you're being suckered out of something and you're not going to be the one who's going to get anything out of it. Yeah. Even though he was a superman, there wasn't any food in the house. Stupid woman. Didn't she realize that the Nazis were going to make jobs for everybody? There would be plenty of food and clothing and the new house. Everything they wanted. The glorious future of Germany was to be theirs. And their children would someday rule the world. But his wife, silly woman, still wondered where the next meal was coming from. Hans didn't like that kind of talk. It was dangerous. For that kind of talk, people should be put in jail. Hans had swallowed the bait all right. And these were the men who baited the hook. Why? So that Hans could come to power? Of course not. That is just actual footage, right? That looks like actual footage. No, I think that they do. Well, OK, this scene maybe. I know there are like some shots where they have actors and some shots where they have real footage. I think, yeah. this, I think I think this still is real footage. If which, not, these are very impressive body doubles. Yeah, which also, uh, if the uh, the guy on the right is uh, who I think he is, Gary. Is... Oh, not, not, not Gary. Gary. Uh, yeah, yeah, Gary. The the fat guy on the right. Is that Gary? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's after he got really fat, then, because he only got really fat in like late in the war. Um. I thought it was the SA guy. Um, the one you that mean, they eliminated in 34. Uh, in the Night of Long Knives. Um, by the way, just, it doesn't matter. Not be long <laughs> gone. On, onward we go. So they could come to power. They would merely use Hans to help them get there. He would do the dirty work for them. Hundreds and thousands of others like him, all playing a sucker's game. They gambled with other people's liberty, and of course they lost their own. A nation of suckers. Hitler needed these people. I like how they there show lots of work bits of Hitler done. where he had messy hair, <laughs> and a little bit sticking out in the back. Well, this can't is have just, him look too good. This is just from trying for the will. Yeah. Uh, so like. Yeah, you know, it was slightly windy that day. Um, yeah, you know, that's uh, that's why uh, uh, the I'm forgetting the name of the director, uh, whatever her name is. Um, she uh, she like specifically was trying to get shots with the flags fu uh, fully unfurled and everything. So she put a bunch of the cameras directly uh, leeward so that they it would capture all that. It's uh, part of the cinematography. Lenny Riefenstahl. Thank you.
There were trade unions to be smashed because unions were organized and might offer resistance. There were many political parties in Germany. These the Nazis destroyed. They were determined to smash every organization where people might bend yeah, together they, and They resist. acknowledged everyone there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Catholic Center Party? Was that actually the name of the Center Party? Oh, uh, that... I think that's a rough translation of one of them, yeah. They had multiple, multiple parties, but I'm pretty sure there was a Catholic one, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it was, uh, uh, so, oh, it didn't, in its German name, it didn't have a, because its German name is Deutsche uh, Zentrum Spartei. But they, uh, they did follow the Christian democratic philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and was a very specifically Catholic party. Um, or I should say is. It's still around. Um their 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 sole elected member. They have one person in the European Parliament, and that's it. <laughs> Hang in there. With it, the, their total membership right now, total six hundred. Sounds about right. <laughs> um, didn't realize that they were a party. Mm-hmm. There were Jews to be beaten and killed. The Jews were not powerful, but they were a convenient excuse for all the nation's ills. And besides, a Nazi party member could not take over this man's store. Hundreds of... So, also notice the, uh, the, like, you know, the, it's talking about the scapegoating, which is, you know, a key part of, of, uh, of fascism. Um, but also that and i've heard it often called a a kleptocracy that um that they were ultimately uh using their power to enrich themselves to steal hence klepto kleptocracy yes um that this was a that fascism was ultimately a form of kleptocracy um and uh this is it's interesting. This is making a lot of different arguments about like what fascism is, but it's, also it's just thorough. Yeah, it's thorough. It's to the point, and it, like um, uh, I think I forget what book it was in, but there was like a it was a George Orwell book where um, he was giving like a personal critique of like uh, I think it was like socialism in england or whatever it's like oh why didn't it take off and he kind of in this one chapter went on a on a rant of like hey if you're delivering a message like we get it theory is important but you gotta deliver the message to the average person in a way that they would understand and if you rely too much on academic gobbledygook you're going to turn people off mm -hmm. and you know this is a perfect example of that they're they're using very straightforward metaphors and language that any just about anyone can understand to the point where again 70 years later it still works mm -hmm. and realize this is before all the uh major books on on fascism and trying to like define it you know especially on like bread tube you'll see the you know okay now let's go to umberto echo to define what it is. it's like no this it, let's just and, go that, and that's a perfect example because so many arguments uh in like the academic sense, they have to start with, well, how do we define oh, all these yeah. terms? You, you get bogged down in these details, but oh. when the conversation is supposed to be, it doesn't matter. It's just bad. We need to stop the bad. <laughs> you know, you, you have, you know, yeah, it, no it's idea. Sim it simplifies the process when you could just skip that stuff and go, look, whatever it is, it's bad. We need to stop it. One of the early critiques of my dissertation was, well, you haven't defined race. And it's like... <laughs> a competition in which How? one person has to get to the end of a, of a distance <laughs> before everyone else. Your move. And it's just like... Really? Yeah, and, they want, and they want you to define it with other academics' definitions, right? It can't be your own unless you're making a point of it being your own. 
Um, uh, it's like it's like the equivalent of uh, an entry job requiring job experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's also it's it's like you're being hired to do a job that doesn't exist yet. You're literally creating it, and yet you're expected to reference everybody before you. What? Yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> and it's uh, so many things where it was like, define um, incorporation. And it's like, well, I have this like large explanation that takes an entire paragraph. It's like, yeah, but do it in, uh, do it in five words. Ah! <laughs> choosing who is, uh, choosing who is allowed to be within the American body politic. Boom. Got it. But, it, it was one of those things that I had to, like, there was so much of that introduction that just got reworked and reworked and reworked to, to add more and more definitions. And then finally, when I go to defend the dissertation, no joke, one of the questions was like, you know, when you go to make this into a book and everything, what are, uh, what is going to be one of the key things that you edit down? And I looked at everyone, this is over Zoom. I looked at everyone and just straight up said, get rid of all the theory mumbo jumbo in the beginning. <laughs> it's like, this is the main thing they were harping on me to do. And I basically just said, I don't care about you. <laughs> I don't care about what you have to say about this. I'm getting rid of it. <laughs> um, yeah, that I, I saw a couple of the members' uh, eyes kind of go, hmm? <laughs> but I am nothing if not a cynic. Anyways. Catholics were put in jail because the Catholic Church had strength and could resist the Nazi drive for power. They had split the nation into a hundred pieces, and then one by one, they had destroyed the pieces. Over these broken pieces, the Nazis rode into power. One party, one nation, one religion. One that's flesh, a one bone, one true religion. One that's actually a direct quote of Nazi propaganda. The uh, one party, one... Um, nation, one people. Wow, they're writing this stuff for us. You can't make this shit up, boys. Um, let me let me find it uh, real quick. I can find the posters. Um, because it was their campaign slogan in 1932 and 33. Um. Do I have to type it in German? Thank you. Um, 12, 16. Just taking note of the time just in case it uh, decides that we're not allowed to keep the time. Um, and here we go. And it says, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. Um, so Ein Volk. Folk, it's actually the same word in English, folk, as in, you know, people. One people, one, uh, you could say government, that really means nation um, in this sense, uh, and one leader, Führer. Um, ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. I find it funny how, like, Volk does just mean folk, but, like, if you were to imagine translated like that, well, how do they are folks? <laughs> the folks of the German rock, yes, we are. And just instantly, just like, it's like hmm, the intimidation it, it loses, factor has gone down a little bit. It loses all its dignity. Um, but you can see this was like, um, you know, um, oh no, this is, uh, for uh, this is, yay, the fear is for us. But like, this was like literally their their campaign slogan in 1932. Like, this was the yeah, this it, it, was uh, so that's what they're quoting. But, but yeah, because like so, the the parts in this that are like propagandized are done in such a way to make it a little more These relatable for Americans. Won. But to make it a little more relatable for Americans. But otherwise, like, what is there to make up? They don't need to make anything up. Yeah, it's like I've I've seen people trying to be all like apologists about freaking 
Nazis. Um, and they're like, well, it's Hollywood that, that has turned them into cartoon villains. And it's like, they literally did that to themselves. Yeah, like, like, like what goose stepping alone is already cartoonish and they you, do it. It's like, have you seen triumph of the will? Like, come on, <laughs> you don't have to, uh, you don't, that was made for them by them. And they still managed to come off as villains. Although I do love the fact that the, uh, you know, the ending scene in Star Wars is uh, based off of Triumph of the Will. Doesn't surprise me, but this time the good guys triumph, so take that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Chewbacca didn't get a medal, so we've got to rectify that. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> These men had won their struggle for power. They now ruled all of Germany. But still they had trouble with their oldest and most persistent enemy, the truth. They found that truth does not die easily. And so they decided to abolish truth. One great source of truth is literature. So they burned books, 20 million of them. Many great men in Germany who were spokesmen for truth were jailed or driven from their country teachers, writers, scientists. Education was discouraged. In five years, college attendance dropped 53%. It was forbidden to listen to a British radio program. Yeah, so the interesting thing um, in, terms of, um, in terms of those book burnings, um, you know uh, who was the first target of book burning? Uh, it was the um, Sexual Witzenkraft. Yeah. The Sexual Research Center, yep. Sexual... Uh, I'm trying to find his name. So, as a matter of fact, they did indeed first come for the transgenders. Yeah, quite literally. Um, yeah. Founding of... Uh, Magnus Hirschfeld. That's what I, who I was looking for. Yeah, I, I considered making a video on him, but it was too depressing for me to go through with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, he... Uh, though he died in 35 in France, I would have thought that he... Uh, oh, but that... Probably the, the trauma of that... Of that... Uh, um, expulsion was um, enough to kill him because he was expelled in 34. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Magnus Hirschfeld um, was the uh, first target. Although, you know, because uh, they actually had a whole list of books, you know what? who was first on that book? Was actually an American. I mean, the first book on that list and also an American? Who would that be? Friends Boaz. Literally, the first book on the list was an American. He was born in Germany, by the way, but also a Jew. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for, for uh, a quick uh, interesting fact about Magnus Hirschfeld is, uh, bef you know, before, like during his time, the term gender, while it technically existed as a word, it did not mean what it does now. Like the concept of a gender being separate from sex just in the medical field did not exist yet. They they had mm -hmm. they had not delved into it. But Magnus still understood the concept of being trans, but because of the limited words at the time, he was the one who came up with the term uh, transsexual. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason why that was the word that came first was because, well, gender wasn't a term yet. So uh, like he literally was the first person to create a term, a mo or rather a modern scientific slash medical term for people who wanted who felt that their expression did not match their body. But he actually performed surgical transition as well. That is correct. He was the first one to do it. Yeah. Well, so he wasn't actually the first. That's that's incorrect. But it, uh, oh. yeah, no, there there was actually a whole litany of of things that could be considered first. On that, you know, it's one of those things where... You I know, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
you said that's superlative, and I started shaking. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you should say he was the first to offer it as a regular service. To offer it as like an inclu- an all inclusive service, like as a yeah. like you can transition. Yeah. Like that that just wasn't a thing. And especially uh, like a- acknowledging it as a treatment towards a condition. Yeah. Because uh, he he was specifically inspired by like he, I mean, it's ninety nine percent likely he was gay himself, but he never said so. But yeah, he did have a friend who was gay, who someone found out about it. Roommates and, with no no no. <laughs> like someone someone found out that his friend was gay, and like he the his friend knew that his life was over, and he got depression and killed himself. Oh, and, and that's so, what inspired him to do the... Uh... Yeah, because like, he, he's like... Because uh, to him, he didn't um, have any prejudice against it, but he, he was fascinated. Like, what is it about, you know, not being straight that makes people depressed and commit suicide? And it didn't take long for him to find out, huh, they're not being treated like human beings. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we try to treat them like human beings and understand, <laughs> understand someone? And of course, that's when he started the Institute and he would try to give speeches to uh, to be like, hey, no, they're not monsters. They're they can't help that they're you might say they're born that way, you know, sort of thing, which didn't get very far. But, you know, uh, at, at the very least, a lot of like modern understandings about lgbt he was able to achieve before the nazis burned it down like he even um he even did a uh a study that by the standards of the time was done really well where he investigated the whole stereotype of like are gay people predators and are they predators against children and he did a large study interviewing as many gay people as he could find since he was trusted in the community Well, it's also important to point out that, uh, you know, Weimar Germany was like one of the most like tolerant societies in terms of in terms of homosexuality. Uh, It is kind of a myth that uh, they were, uh, you know, this this super tolerant, forward thinking society. No, I mean, like they were they were hugely anti-Semitic throughout the Weimar period. Like that's just true of the. But it was more it was more passive. Well, no, it was uh, it, like Hitler was playing off of their own prejudices. That's well, no, 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 no. Like, I, I, I mean, is. no, no. I mean, like the prejudices were there, but they were, but they were less likely to be like actively violent towards them until there were several. Were, like, bro- uh, there were several pogroms during the uh, Weimar period. So. Well, like like homosexuals. I mean, oh yeah, no. Uh, but the that's one of those ones where violent, or, like gay bashing as as a thing is a is a post-world war ii thing you know yeah Um, but uh basically like he interviewed all of his clients and you know asked them like hey did you ever do anything like did did you ever like like like, do anything but he also asked more importantly did someone ever do something to you that because there was also the stereotype of oh you're only this way because someone raped you as a kid or whatever yeah and like he, if I if I remember the numbers correctly, he, he interviewed like uh, like ten thousand people, like like a decent number of people. That's it was, really it, it was high. Like, like it was that at least a, a that would be a representative sample. It, it was it was at least like in the thousands, if not if not at ten thousand. And it right. basically, you know, Kin didn't Kenny not even uh, like Ken, Kenny Kinsey? I can't remember correctly. He he sort of did, but not quite as fully open as or not open that's the wrong word it kinsey operated under different like more simplified kinsey thank you tyler it, it was he, he was more simplified in his questions and there was there's much less reliability on oh yeah on, on the but, full scale of honesty which but you i could was probably more, say for i was more talking about too, the, but... the size of his his sample size was yeah. I think smaller than 10,000. Yeah, but uh, if it wasn't 10,000, it was at least like, you know, a few thousand. Basically, he asked a lot of people and the results are, well, well, I'm sure there, I'm sure there were problems with the study because it's a study done in the 30s. The results are almost identical to the same type of studies we do on this today, hmm. where he's just be like, hey, guess what? The average gay person is not a predator. 
And while some of them have unfortunately been raped, that's not the reason why they're gay. Yeah. And so, you know, first person to arrive at all these conclusions that even now we're still having these huge arguments over thanks to the Nazis burning down his facility. <laughs> it is surprising how much uh, of reactionary rhetoric just boils down to old Nazi talking points. Oh, yeah. And I just had somebody on Twitter the other day trying to defend the whole idea that like race is, is real and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, this, this is just, you're just defending eugenics. Like this is just old, you know, 1820, I mean, 1920s BS. That's long dead. Well, I mean, it's real in the same way that super Saiyans are real. <laughs> it's a, it's a real uh, it's a story. Construct. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, society, uh, I always love when people are like, well, you know, how come I can't, that means I can't be white, right? And it's like, no, that still is, like, you still are that. Like, that doesn't mean that you're not a part of American society. American society exists, and that is clearly a social construct. It is literally a society. <laughs> like, it just means that it's an abstract concept that we built up. That's all it means. And that means that it has a history to it, a consequences to that history. Um, it is not purely some biological thing that we just discovered. Um, it's actually not biological in any sense. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's that's the thing that... Uh, that uh, that's how people get sucked into it, right? That's It's all... You become yeah. a sucker to it. Or read an American newspaper. In Nazi Germany, you had to get your information from Dr. Goebbels. He knew what was best for you. You couldn't see this movie. Or listen to this music. And you Jew. couldn't watch Joe Louis fight. Because the champion had black skin. He disproved Hitler's theory of Nordic supremacy. Albert Einstein, one of the world's great scientists, disproved that theory too. He was non-alien, so he had to leave Germany. His mind was dedicated to the search for truth, and the Nazis, having sold a lie, were most afraid of truth. The church was one force in Germany still strong enough to proclaim the truth in public. No doubt is possible that we Christians are in a grave battle. Against us stands a faith out of blood. The battle signals range from cool repudiation to hate-filled causes. Weapons are used that centuries have dulled. The aim of this battle is to dislodge Christianity from our fatherland. This Catholic priest was arrested the following day on charges of immorality. The Protestant church also continued to try and fight for truth. He who desires liberty for himself cannot deny it to others, lest he lose what he has gained. This is the great lesson the world can learn from Germany. The Nazis put this man in a concentration camp. There were others who spoke for truth. And I am proud to say that educators were among them. And I want to point out that uh, one of those speeches, I don't know if they are just directly quoting, but uh, one of those speeches, I've, I've been reading a lot about Napoleon um, just recently because, uh, you know, the movie is coming out. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's just too much to read about the damn guy. It's been literally more books published about him um, than there have been days since his death. No joke. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, the um, speech that they were talking about sounded an awful lot like a speech he had a Catholic priest arrested over in in 1805. Um, literally 
just a few weeks before he uh, reopened France to to Catholicism and had himself crowned and everything. So, um, you know, this was seen as like kind of a contradiction. Um, but it's uh, that sounded a lot like Napoleon. <laughs> What, may I ask, is an Aryan? I don't know myself. But let us see what our present so-called authorities have to say about him. They say he is tall. Burn. <laughs> slender. Got him. <laughs> Blue-eyed. It's black and white, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> and blonde. There is no Aryan race. And more important, there is no master race. There are people who may find these ideas convenient. Oh, I love that phrase. Science. Can <laughs> there are people who may find this convenient? Who find these ideas convenient. That is such a badass way of phrasing that yeah yeah so they're not true they're just convenient yeah i halfway want to use this in the uh in the video i'm editing right now <laughs> go for it man normalize the phrase let's bring it back not that it ever was a thing to begin with but i'll write it down uh 1555 hold on a second guys i gotta write it down um just got a notebook over here. Oh, find these ideas convenient. Brilliant. I'm writing that one down. Don't be got it. I might actually include that in, in the uh, video. Go for it. And not support them. There is no scientific proof that there's any correlation between a man's racial characteristics and his native ability or character. In all racial groups, we find the same range of potentialities. We find idiots, and geniuses, we find criminals, and philanthropists. We must judge each man as an individual, and not by the color of his skin, or his eyes, or by the length of his nose. <laughs> and though that sounded a lot like the Martin Luther King quote, one, that quote came in 1963, um, two, this was like by, by the late thirties, like the whole idea that race was actually a biological thing was, um, pretty much dead. It was only a, a thing in, um, in, uh, fascist countries mostly. Um, and it, that's one of the interesting things I uh, found in this in in making this episode is like unesco put out a statement in 1950 1950 it wasn't even called unesco yet um and the uh and it brought together hundreds of scientists to basically said say what he just said um and they've updated that several times last time they updated it was 1998 um but the uh uh, they, you can still go and find all of these on their website and everything, and it's still kind of like the definitive statement for race is not biological, it is not scientific. Shut the hell up with this uh, whole race realism bullshit. Um, and yeah, it's interesting that they have somebody saying this in 1940. Uh, this movie came out in 1947, three years before the UNESCO statement. And the UNESCO statement caused a huge controversy, even in 1950. I mean, it was like uh, you had, um, you know, like, for instance, McCarthy labeled it as uh, one of his public enemies. 
um, and labeled all the scientists on it as communists and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, red baiting's a thing that, you know, can be applied to anything. <laughs> Although, an interesting thing before we get further on this, uh, you know how you were pointing out that, you know, this is very anti-fascist. Um, and in an age that you would think they'd be focusing a lot on um, on um, anti-communism. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of this stuff would they're implying could be applied to the Soviet Union. Yeah, like like it, it works as like an anti-authoritarianism mm -hmm. video in general as well. But, you know, anti-communism is more than just, uh, you know, Soviet government bad. Yeah. You know, it's, you, you, it's, it's used against any sort of, like, policy that's, like, too far left of center or whatever. Mm -hmm. well, especially red baiting, as in um, using the, the um, accusation of communism to silence opposition. Um, you know, that's a... Uh, that will actually be the next video and we'll see kind of how all of this propaganda usage is flipped right around on it. They flipped completely 180 on its head. Anyways. Bum, bum, bum. Come in, gentlemen. Make yourselves comfortable. You didn't pay your tuition. Get the many fuck out of here. Between individuals, we each have different capabilities, different backgrounds, different views about what's right and what's wrong. Like the difference between me and these gentlemen who have just arrived. But that is not the difference in race. It is a difference in the way we think. Based. <laughs> Remember that. And remember that there is no master race. That is a scientific truth. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. Or stupid. They could be stupid. I am using that definitely. And it's... the great thing is, it's made by the U.S. Army. I could just take an, uh, as much as I want. <laughs> I, I literally took the entire professor scene and posted it on TikTok, and it's my most popular TikTok. Really? <laughs> just it by itself. Wow. <laughs> I just need to find a way to edit edit it into like a Chad version. It's just the difference in the way we think. Bum, 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 bum. You just yeah, have like a start little the, buff uh, professor. Sigma male soundtrack yeah. thing. <laughs> 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 but, dude, that, yeah, I'm, I'm totally using that. Because he's literally making the point that I'm making in, throughout the entire video. <laughs> Again, this is the most based piece of propaganda ever made. It's so good. <laughs> And so, for all practical purposes, truth had been abolished in Germany. A lot of my German friends wondered what had hit them. How did it happen? Where did it start? It started right here. And this was where it could have been stopped. If those people had stood together, if they had protected each other, they could have resisted the Nazi threat. Together, they would have been strong. But once they allowed themselves to be split apart, they were helpless. When that first minority lost out, everybody lost out. They made the mistake of gambling with other people's freedom. So this is, uh, I wonder, um, you know, th when when they, the, the uh, poem, When They Came, um, if that came out before or after this, do you know what I'm talking about? You know, I think that was made during the war. I came for the communists. I said nothing. Uh, um, it says it was published January 6, 1946. Oh, so just before this. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's 
that's essentially the point they're making is the point of that that poem. Um, but even more to the point. Yeah, well, they're also like, you know, defining uh, fascism and like how it's not just this one thing from, you know, Germany in the 30s, you know, or Italy in the 20s or Spain in the uh, 30s, <laughs> that it's like a pervasive and and easy to fall for uh, trick that um, is about power gain ultimately, but through stipu uh, stimulating hatred. So divide and conquer. So what we would call, um, oh wow, uh, not derogatory, uh, defamatory. No, uh, there's a word specifically for like. Uh, with, like Trump was constantly called this. It was a demagogue. Demagogue. There we go. Um, that it's that it's demagoguery for the sake of power, uh, for absolute power. Um, that almost sounds like it would be like in a trivia show or a Jeopardy thing. This next question is in the category of demagoguery. <laughs> um, but it's. It's interesting because they, they define it and then they still use it to show like how this can be in America and not as like a uh, these people are are um, fascists and these people are fascists. It's like this leads to fascism. Now let's see how those bets paid off. Carl the farmer was gambling on a better life for himself. What he got was extra hours of back-breaking work, as much as a hundred hours a week. He was forced to stay on his land and produce what he was told to produce, because now Hitler was preparing for war. For Heinrich, who owned a hardware store, the bet didn't pay off either. 104,000 small businesses were closed in two years. And for Hans, conditions hadn't improved any. He had a job now in the munitions factory, but he worked long hours for little pay. The working conditions grew increasingly bad. And even though he didn't like the job, he wasn't permitted to leave it. There still wasn't enough food in his house. Hitler said you couldn't have butter and cannon. So Hans couldn't have butter. And when Hitler decided the time was right, Germany went to war. Not by declaring war, but by a carefully prepared sneak attack. Ah, oh, the cowardly bastard. Once again, Hitler <laughs> needed Hans to do his dirty work. Hans was an expert at brutality by this time. And Hitler had decided to use Hans and his brutality against other peoples. The Czechs, the Poles, the French, the Russians. But in the crucial test of war, Hitler's race theories didn't pay off. His pure-blooded supermen were defeated by the mongrel armies he despised. By the British of El Alamein. By the Russians at Stalingrad. And then on D-Day by American soldiers of every color and religion who smashed across Race. the Normandy beaches and drove on through to the heart of Germany. Oh, it's so For the base. misguided Germans who had <laughs> swallowed the Nazi bait, the Nazi game did not pay off. The continent of Europe was strewn with millions of German bodies, pure Aryan bodies. Burn. Karl the farmer was left in the snow outside of Moscow. Heinrich stayed in Italy at Salerno. And Hans, who was going to rule the world, got only a little patch of Normandy that he could call his own. We must never let that happen to us or to our country. We must never let ourselves be divided by race or color or religion, because in this country we all belong to minority groups. I was born in Hungary, you are a Mason. These are minorities. And then you belong to other minority groups too. You are a farmer, you have blue eyes, you go to the Methodist church. Your right to belong to these minorities is a precious thing. 
You have a right to be what you are and say what you think, because here we have personal freedom. We have liberty. And these are not just fancy words. This is a practical and priceless way of living. But we must work at it. We must guard everyone's liberty, or we can lose our own. If we allow any minority to lose its freedom by persecution or by prejudice, we are threatening our own freedom. And this is not simply an idea. This is good, hard, common sense. You see, hey, I heard that nice. here in America is not a question whether we tolerate minorities. America is minorities. And that means you and me. So let's not be suckers. We must not allow the freedom or dignity of any man to be threatened by any act or word. Let's be selfish about it. Let's forget about we and they. Let's think about us. Two, two things to note right there. Firstly, I like how he almost had a reverse objectivism ending, <laughs> where he's like, you know what? Let's be selfish about it. You can imagine Ayn Rand perking up a little bit. No more about them. Yes, yes, more. Yes. How about us? Oh. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not what selfishness is. Like, sure, why not? <laughs> We're collectively selfish. No. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I also like though how, like, after watching all of that, if I were to recreate that today, I find it hilarious that it's so good that my first note on what to change is, eh, maybe don't litter at the end. <laughs> The fact that that's like <laughs> the fact that that is like the biggest moral objection I can find in this whole thing, like moral objection, like oh yeah, well I don't think we can get away with littering today. Uh, let's uh, you know we got to protect the environment and all. Let's have them throw it in the trash can instead. <laughs> yeah. Burn it. <laughs> or oh, ooh, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> burn it yes <laughs> and, and you know even though i even though i think it's technically grammatically correct there's something very american about how he phrased it as america is minorities huh like uh, I, tyler pointed out funny you mentioned objectivism one of the guys in the crowd is frank o'connor who is who actually was ayn rand's husband Interesting. I'm gonna look up who Frank O'Connor was. Well, like when, when you say in the crowd, did you mean the like in the the group of Germans or like at the at the very beginning with the soapbox guy? Can I find him younger? Hold on a second. Um, here is uh, share screen. So here he is. Um. But uh, also, no, he wasn't married to Ayn Rand. Am I just looking up the wrong Frank O'Connor? Yeah, uh, I'm not seeing anything about him and Ayn Rand. Maybe look up Ayn Rand's page to see who her husband was. Charles Francis O'Connor. I don't recognize him from uh, um, he wrote something as as husbands go. <laughs> oh, it's a comedy film. Ah. Uh, I'm not seeing anything on, um, uh, on, uh, here we go. Let's see here. He, he could have been uncredited. Yeah. Especially in the army. Uh, they wouldn't credit most people. 
I don't know. Just uh, just like go back in time and just, hey, uh, Ayn, uh, look at what your husband participated in. No, <laughs> this cannot be true. <laughs> Yeah, that so that was extremely good though. The uh, the it, you know as you say it, it holds up extremely yeah. well. But what does it show in terms of propaganda uh, at this point in history? Hmm. I mean, I guess in one sense because like the pre the previous one was like oh here's why were fighting this dark, scary thing far away. But this is kind of more domestic focused. Like it does use Germany as an example, but this is kind of, you know, to to purposefully use the phrase, bring it on home. And, you know, it's kind of, I, I think like that's enough of a shift because it is kind of getting into the Cold War era propaganda of, hey, American people, here's how you should be thinking. But yeah. you know, rather than here's a scary thing from far away, which and I guess those can overlap, but you know what I mean. Yeah, but uh, but you got an excellent insight there. It's it's that um, the propaganda has turned from um, uh, you know, basically just support scary the out scary outer force has transformed into like there is still a scary outer force, but. The focus is transformed to here's how you should act, behave, and think, yeah. rather than you know expect this. And it's not just that it's um, it, that it's a scary outer force. It's uh, you know it's that it has become interior, right? That yeah. it it is uh, um, you know American. Like they're not saying that that fascism is un-American or anything. They're saying you know, it can happen to you. Um, yes. Kind of like what happened with uh, with Reefer Madness, where it was like that. But uh, now it's been uh, that that domestic agenda. Um, yeah, that's that's the perfect term. The the domestic it's domesticized the agenda. Yeah, um, especially like um, I guess you could. Yeah, they talked about like suckers, for example. But you know, in the original, um, it's like oh, like the American people just like don't know any better. And that's why it's important to stay updated and educated and all this stuff. And while this sort of has that, the fact that it is like now like, Oh, fascism can come from within. It's kind of a slight shift from the poor, innocent American damsels in distress to like, Hey, this is your duty to, you know, be on the lookout for this sort of thing because it comes from within not just from without it, yeah. it's, it's it's less it's almost like less innocent in a way hmm. sorry if you guys could probably hear that that was like 20 motorcycles right outside my window um but yeah so this shows how uh they're taking the techniques of of uh propaganda uh, you know, so fully implemented during World War II, and starting to use it in de as a domestic agenda um, to to fit a domestic agenda. Um, you know, in, in this case, we full uh, we you know full heartedly agree with it, right? Um, to the point that you know, I was going like, I'm going to use some of this propaganda in my own stuff. <laughs> but the uh, the key thing is that um they've taken that you know why we fight and other stuff that came out during world war ii like for instance they actually made a reference in this to a um to a disney propaganda piece um because disney made a bunch of propaganda during the war really good stuff too um unfortunately i couldn't find good enough quality downloads to to watch any of it um and the dvd set I kid you not, costs a hundred and seventy dollars. Jeez. Yeah. And I just realized I was at my parents' house like two weeks ago, and I could, uh, I could have, I could have freaking gotten it. They have it at home. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> this, this ring, this ring could have gotten me another DVD box set. 
No, it's fine. You can just visit your parents. No, I could have gotten more. <laughs> the uh, so I think that's the ultimate takeaway from from this one. Um, how uh, how are you doing on time? By the way, Tiger Star, are you good for the next one? Uh, I do have a video I need to get done. Uh, how long would the next one take? Oh, it's definitely going to be one if we start. We're not going to finish. Uh, no matter what, we're not going to finish it. If we, even if we did would it, it be better to just have it devoted to its own episode? Uh, I guess. Um, the only thing about it is it's a uh, it fits perfectly with what we're doing right now, or with what we just watched. It's like the exact inverse. We're going to hate every second of it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and what's fascinating is that this next one is from the John Birch Society, right? It's from, um, oh, I forgot to say what the name of the, so uh, of the thing that they directly referenced uh, in, in this one that was from Disney. Uh, the Disney video that they referenced was a, uh, was a cartoon called Education for Death. Um, yeah, I've seen it on YouTube. Yeah. It's really good. It's one of those ones where it was like, um, you know, it, it's not like the, you know, Donald Duck one where he's just like, wakes up and he's a Nazi. Whoopsies. <laughs> you can't even name your child. They've got a list of pre-approved names. Well, that that was an actual communist thing. Um, no joke. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, I just remember yeah. that from the Disney I, thing. I think my favorite one of the of the soviet required names that were there from uh from uh 1929 uh, 1928 to uh 1945 when they actually had required naming um one of them was mielor m e l o r mielor because in in russian you have uh, e's are like yeah um so in in Mielor was Marx, Engels, Lenin, October Revolution. <laughs> Mielor. <laughs> it was actually the most popular name for in uh, in Russia for for a decade. Um, you, a lot of Russians probably know somebody named Mielor, and <laughs> it's Marx, Engels, Lenin, October Revolution. <laughs> Mielor. Um. Anyways. Uh, besides the point, the uh, education for death was uh, essentially s talking about how like um, people grew up with uh, with Nazism and um, you know basically internalized it completely to the point that they were willing to die for the fatherland and everything, even when uh, it was completely against their interests. Um, and that's what he was saying right at the end uh, is the like they were, I think he literally said something like they were educated for death. And I was like, oh, oh that's the one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a really good movie. Um, too bad I couldn't find a good copy of it. <laughs> um, yeah. So do you want to see how this uh, this uh domestication of of propaganda has turned in uh, oh that's a good way of phrasing it domestication of propaganda um how i, sh I should uh i should trademark that phrase while i can <laughs> um but after the war the, the propaganda was domesticated right and we just saw how the U.S. Army continued to play a significant role in trying to shape people's opinions. And by um, the 50s, it was house trained. <laughs> but in another group arose that uh, that um, one could see as being very proto-fascist. They t talk about uh, they are literally the caricature of the of the guy on the street that they were talking about, with, you know, saying I'm an American American, not one of these, you know, hyphenated Americans. That's a that's a quote of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> he actually the, said hyphenated Americans. Yeah, he has an entire speech called hyphenated Americans. No, I, that that. I'm an American American, not a hyphenated American. That's a direct quote. Uh, hyphenated American 
it's kind of, it's kind of a I kind of like that phrase. It's actually still a pretty common phrase. I've never heard it before. Oh yeah, um, it's it's the thing. Uh, I bet you there's even like a Wikipedia on it. Um, but he uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt coined it. Yeah, there is literally a uh, thing on that. Um, Was Teddy being xenophobic? No, he would never do that. No, <laughs> not Teddy. <laughs> not the white supremacist. Man, if, o- if only we could, like, you know, Jurassic Park, the good bits of FDR and TR, and, like, combine them together right? into, like, a... That we would have like such a, a super president. Oh my no, gosh, a, that would be amazing. A new dealer who simultaneously can actually run a marathon. <laughs> oh my gosh. As a boy, I had asthma and my dad told me to get over it. So I did. <laughs> he literally did. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Teddy, I want to like you, but then you talk about minorities and I grow sad. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess we don't really have time for another one, but we can just keep on talking. <laughs> um, you know, let's yeah, just... I, I would say like, I basically got another like 15, 20 minutes. All right. Yeah. Um, cause, uh, what's interesting about all this is, is, you know, how much we're drawing from parallels, right? Where, you know, oh, this is, um, this is the, uh, uh, the Disney thing. This is from, uh, you know, this is referencing the, uh, the uh, reefer madness and, and this kind of stuff. Like propaganda is its own art form, right? It's um, just like whenever you see a star Wars reference somewhere, when you see a Simpsons reference somewhere, I guess <laughs> you're drawing on influences. Yeah. But it's also, you know how like art historians always do that thing where it's like art is like the only thing they're talking about um, and it kind of just builds off of each other. Um, and maybe technology sometimes comes in, but like larger events in history, you know, like um, when t- people start talking about impressionism, they're not, they're, they don't seem to reference, you know, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, for some reason, even though that was entirely a huge part of it, um, yeah. you know, it's it's oh well, the Impressionists got it from the Mane- the the uh, Pointillists, and the Pointillists got it, from, you know, and it's like this, it's like entirely incestuous, right? Um, <laughs> I, mean, I suppose everything has like an inner influence and an outer influence. Yeah. I suppose you could. Yeah, call but that's it. that's just my my critique of art historians is you know they uh they tend to forget you know hit the rest of history, um, but what you can do is, with propaganda and what we kind of are doing is an art history of this. Obviously, we're not uh, treating it as entirely incestuous. Um, really can't since you know the whole point is that it's propagandizing something but even within the art form um and yeah it's an art form um there are influences and you know the great works end up influencing later stuff hey kiddos how about we have fun and watch why we fight Oh my god, Dad, that one is so lame. We happen to watch Don't Be a Sucker now. That's what the kids are into. <laughs> I, you know, I don't understand your your modern kid propaganda. You know, it was cool when it was fight the scary thing over there, but now you're talking about things here? I, I, I don't get it. Why can't I? St- I'm not allowed to stab the people who are the bad guys in this one. <laughs> 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 Although the next one we'll watch, they'll kind of be advocating stabbing the uh, the Maybe bad guys. We should stab someone. Uh, maybe not. Whatever, communist. No, 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 that's, no that's a little uncalled for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just look at how the John Birch Society actually reacted to MLK getting shot. Yeah. Um, it's it's bad. <laughs> like. 
we're entering into some very dark footloose territory over here. What is is MLK in like a footloose reference? What? Well, no, just but it's still like the whole plot of Footloose is that like the uh, John Birchian conservative like society took over to the whole town to the point where they banned music and dance. I thought it was like that they were vengeful because like, you know, there was a fire to dance or something like that. I, uh, I, I forget. Cause I know there's multiple versions of it. And, and a, Oh, and I a might book, be mixing but, virgins. Uh, but I, I mean, there may have been like a catalyst that they leapt upon to enact. Yeah. The ruling, a uh, but, Reichstag you know. fire, as you will. Yeah, <laughs> quite literally. Uh, um, and, and it went right up to a book burning before the priest was like, okay, maybe this is a bad idea. <laughs> and um, and what's interesting on that is, is they will use all of these same kind of techniques. Um, just to give a, a brief history of what happens in the uh, f- late 40s and early 50s with with uh, propaganda is that you start seeing a lot more commercialization um, of propaganda. You know, as, as uh, the 50s roll along and the golden age of capitalism um, roll along, you know, everybody's getting their nice uh, ticky-tacky houses with their nice white picket fences and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're building highways and everybody's got a great industrial job because they were able to get one with their American high school degree because that was a thing. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, really good times for white people. Uh, but the uh, that also meant that, um, you know, propaganda became a lot more inspirational, but also a buy this thing, you know, be American and buy this soap, be American and, you know, get the truly American cigarettes and yeah. stuff like that, or support the, uh, support the, uh, troops in Korea and, uh, because, you know, they are securing Liberty and all that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of it is still very domesticated, right? Um, a lot of it is very much about uh, domestic policy ra- rather than, you know, supporting the troops. Like with Why We Fight, it was like with the Korean War stuff, it was more uh, be American, uh, you know, don't be a communist. You know, we're fighting communists over there, so don't don't let them affect you here. Um, it was still very much about domestic policy. Yeah. Um, and throughout the 50s, you see uh, a lot more uh, commercial usage of propaganda techniques, um, you know, especially as commercials in and of themselves become more and more of a thing. Uh, first uh, TV broadcast in the United States was in 1934. Um but that was of a baseball game. It was already including commercials through the through radio broadcasts. But um, you don't really see mass adoption of televisions, especially the old mechanical ones, really sucked. Um, and uh, until the um, early 1950s, by the end of the 50s, it's basically a standard household appliance. Everyone has one, unless you're poor. Um, you know, and like it's an insult to say. Oh, you only have a radio at home, right? It's like saying that you only have a dumb phone. Um, the uh, there and that shapes the way that propaganda is used to the point that you start get seeing these TV documentaries. So what we just watched was basically a uh, a film short, um, something you would go to the cinemaplex and they just have running before the movie, um, and the uh um you know as people no longer needed to do that because they could just watch it on their television it started getting more and more privatized and so advocacy groups would make their own films um probably uh a good example of this would be uh all the political stuff from the 1960 election um 
was kind of the first time we started seeing these like TV shorts, not just political commercials with all the, uh, you know, the, you remember I like Ike, for instance, is a great example of uh, a political cartoon that um, just wedges itself in your brain. Um, what do you say to that, Dr. Jones? I like Ike. <laughs> And Kennedy had his own one, which was catchy, but also had terrible wording because it was literally just Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. It's like, Don't be a schmo. Vote for Joe. I mean, Jack. I mean, who? It's a Kennedy. <laughs> um, but uh, the uh, there was a couple of TV short documentaries like 12 minute documentaries in the 1960 election um that were basically propaganda right they were political propaganda put out by their their respective um political parties um but we don't really see the best version of that until barry goldwater's campaign um in 1964 when he put out the uh, Time for Choosing documentary, which was actually an internal documentary meant only for party members to see at campaign headquarters and that, and they just have it playing on loop. But um, the uh, this became the uh, this became such a powerful thing, especially when some stupid Hollywood star nobody cared about named Ronald Reagan decided to make a speech about uh, using the themes of that documentary um, that became quite the viral sensation. And then they remixed them into a new thing and put it out on CBS, um, the last of the four networks. Um, and that became, uh, that wasn't really well seen but the John Birch Society really liked it um, and then went on to make their own version, um, which will be the thing we watch next. So anything else you want to add? The most based propaganda ever. <laughs> The uh... first we watched one that was based, and the next one will be based in lies. Yeah, well, it's the uh, John Birch Society, the but... Jack Tree Society. Oh, oh, I wanted to play this for you earlier. We didn't have time. The the Mitchell Tree of jo uh, John Birch Society. So to get an understanding, everybody, of wh who the John Birch Society was, let's watch how uh how uh, the Mitchell trio um portrayed it and i want to find the find it uh, cuz there's actually a live version Will you let me see? Is it this? Hold on. No. I want the live ver No way. I I swear it used to be... Uh, it used to be uh, accessible. Oh, oh, here it is. And I have previously watched it. <laughs> Hold on a second. I have to... I watched it previously so well that it uh, it remembered the last time I watched it <laughs> and where I had watched it. Um, share screen. Uh, share. Let's go with the uh, entire screen and share system audio. Heard on television. To welcome right. for their first appearance. With well, first of all, this is the Mitchell Trio, so you know that is John Denver right there. 
Is there a clavern in your town? Oh, what? No, that's your friendly neighborhood KKK. Dang it. I didn't look at the thing. I just looked at the... Please uh, tell me that's satirical. Uh, yeah, of course. It's, it, uh, have you never heard this? No. If not, then why not have us die? Does that make me appreciate John Denver even more, though? You'll never recognize us. There's a smile upon, upon our face. face. We're changing all our dirty sheets and a clean up, up the place. place. <laughs> yep, since we got a lawyer and the public relations man, we're your, your friendly, friendly liberal neighborhood Ku Klux Klan. Yes, we're your friendly liberal neighborhood Ku Klux Klan. And since we got that lawyer and that public relations man, of course we did you punk reporter, but he was just obscene. And you can't call us no filthy name. What's his Anglo Saxon mean? Alaman left, Alaman right. But then he told Zillary's mean tonight. Because the clans collected so much cash that now by gum we're rich white trash. Now I've heard it said our leadership's all about to lead. Well, I'm telling you that just ain't true. Why three of them can read? <laughs> Take a red exalted dragon. Now some folks think he's bad. You should meet his sweet old mother and her brother. Who's his dad? <laughs> yes, sir, your friendly liberal neighborhood Ku Klux Klan. Okay, so you get the joke, right? <laughs> Not all Southerners are inbred, just the ones in the Klan. <laughs> uh, it's that, great. That is the best thing I've ever seen John Denver do. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, see? John Denver wasn't all bad. I'm no, he's not bad at all. I'm I'm still happy. I'm still happy Monterey took his life, but you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> hey, that was uh, on his own doing. <laughs> um, is it this one? Oh, we're meeting at the courthouse. That yeah. Okay. Hold on. That that is the um. They these were actually performed right next to each other, but for some reason I can't find the television version. Oh, we're meeting at the courthouse at eight o'clock tonight. You just come in the door and take the first turn to, to the, the right. right. Be careful when you get there. We hate to be bereft, but we're taking down the names of everybody, everybody turning left. Oh, we're the John Birch <laughs> Society, the John Birch Society, here to save our country from a communistic what? Join the John Birch Society, help us fill the ranks. To get this movement started, we need lots of tools and cranks. Now there's no one that we're certain the Kremlin doesn't touch. We think that Westbrook Hegler doth protest a bit too much. We only hail the hero from whom we got our name. We're not sure what he did, but he's our hero just the same. We're the John Burt Society, the John Burt Society. Socialism is the ism, this most of all. Join the John Burt Society, there's so much to do. Have you heard their serving vodka at the WCTU? <laughs> well, you've heard about the agents that we've already named. Well, NCA has agents that are flatly unashamed. We're after Rosie Clooney. We've gotten Pinky Lee. And the day we get Red Skelton, won't that be a victory? Oh, we're the John Birch <laughs> Society, the John Birch Society. Norman Vincent Peale may think he's kidding us the more. But the John Birch Society knows he spilled the beans. He keeps on preaching brotherhood, but now we, we know, know what, what he means. means. <laughs> we'll teach you how to spot him in the cities or the sticks. Or even Jasper Junction is just full of Bolsheviks. The CIA subversive. And so's the FCC. There's no one left but the and we. And we're not sure of the. We're the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society. Here to save our country from a communistic what? Join the John Birch Society. Holding off the Reds. We'll use our hands and hearts. And if we must, we'll use our heads. Do you want Justice Warren to be your commissar? Do you want Mrs. Khrushchev in there with the DAR? You cannot trust your neighbors or even next of kin. If mommy is a commie, then you gotta turn her in. <laughs> Oh, we're the John Birch Society, the John Birch Society, fighting for the right to fight the right, fight for the right. Join the John Birch Society as we're marching on. We'll all be glad to see you when we're meeting in the dawn, in the dawn, in the John Birch Society.
<laughs> All right, so you get the point, though. I, uh, I need to listen to these guys. This is great. Yeah, they, they have so much, like, um, very, very political stuff. I mean, like, like right here, I, I was not a Nazi polka, <laughs> which is referring to denazification. It's also, it's also perfect for the arsenal of, but country's always been conservative. And you're like, well, I've already got uh, three of the four highwaymen, and I've already got, uh, you know, Woody Gun three. But here, here's another group I could throw at you. Yeah, but a lot of people at this point would differentiate between country and folk. Okay, I've still got three of the four of the highwaymen, but you know, uh, Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, who, who... Chris Christopherson. Is he uh, is he liberal? Indeed, he is. Huh. And then Waylon Jennings was the conservative. Ah. Uh, um. Uh, but uh, yeah, great. Uh, they have a lot of uh, of great stuff. I mean, I think the biggest thing that a lot of people, uh, I I don't really see people trying to say that like country was always conservative. What I normally see is that people try to say country wasn't was didn't used to be political um which oh, i could just use this at them too yeah. Uh, oh yeah although my uh, have you ever heard um uh uh what the heck is it called uh the world war Two song um Okay. Oh, oh, Almanac Singers. That's it. It was on a Saturday night. And the moon you ever heard this? Uh, no. So this is uh, uh, the Ballad of October 16th. It's an anti-World War II song. No joke. Oops, oops, no, no. It was on a Saturday night as the moon was shining bright. They passed a conscription bill, and the people they did say for many miles away. It was on a Saturday on Capitol Hill. Now Frank and Roosevelt told the people what he felt. We damn near believed what he said. He said, I hate war, and so does Eleanor, but we won't be safe till everybody's dead. <laughs> I was standing by her side when my dear old mother died. I promised oh God, this is giving me Ukrainian discourse flashbacks. Ah. Hold on a second. JP Morgan loves me so. <laughs> okay, it goes on, right? <laughs> I love that song so much. It's it's so like weird because it was recorded in um in, so uh the October sixteenth that they are referring to is October sixteenth, nineteen forty. This was recorded in November of nineteen forty, um, and released in, in uh, January of nineteen forty one. Obviously, Pearl Harbor had not happened yet. Yeah. It I, I, it just reminds me of like the Ukrainian discourse now where it's like, yes, I get it. The anti-war arguments, but guys, like this is a little different. It's just a little. Yeah. yeah. But you know, but hindsight. It, it, yeah. It's one of those things where the Almanac singers didn't really uh, do any anti-World War II stuff after Pearl Harbor, you know? Well, yeah, you get a new, <laughs> you get a new Almanac every year. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and based on their instrumentation, I'd say they were a farmer's almanac. And like, although I'll also point out, I have uh, some Johnny rebel in that freaking folder and oh, yeah, God. to say that they were freaking not political. <laughs> well, that's a satire. That doesn't count. We're not uh -huh. really, we're not really horrible racists. We're just having a fun laugh. Oh, and uh, USS Chicago just redeemed Show King. <laughs> um, is 
Uh, yeah, let's put on some BB King. That sounds great. <laughs> well, if you want to show it, <laughs> I have to grab this cat who's going to be angry with me because I'm waking him up. Come here. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, no. Did your cat make the trumpet noise upon being awoken? No, he did the. <laughs> yeah. My cat always does like a like a it sounds like a startled trumpet. Yeah, ah! yeah, that's normally when he wakes up. But uh, you know, I'm being mean and picking him up, and he's just like, "I'm done with you," because <laughs> I took him to the vet today. Um, also, uh, since we're talking about King and there's a Chicago uh, just asked. <laughs> uh, he doesn't want his own room. He just wants to be around me. There's a reason why he was within reaching distance. He's very much a, uh, you know, a cat that wants to be around you kind of thing. Yeah. Like my, my, my cat, now that she's like 15, she's getting old. So I, I'm noticing her like being more and more closer to me and like little things like that and mm. doing various old things. Her, her meows are a little shriller. Mm. And it's the thing that I, I don't know when it started, but I just noticed like two weeks ago is, you know, how sometimes like when people get old, they kind of shake a little. Oh yeah. Like yeah, my dad's, under. my dad's got that really bad. Yeah. Like uh, apparently it's common with old cats too. And mm -hmm. uh, so I just kind of like noticed, uh, n noticed that with her and I'm like, Oh, she's, she's getting old. And then the, the thing that actually tugged at my heartstrings a little bit because apparently this is also a sign of cats being old, is I when she went to get a drink of water, instead of uh, dipping her neck down to uh, lap up the water with her tongue like a normal cat would, she scooped it up with her paw. And I looked it up, and uh, like the two most common reasons, or the three most common reasons for that, A, she somehow couldn't see the water line, but it's a food bowl, of course she could. Um, or water bowl, of course she could. B, uh, her neck is broken, which, uh, no, no, her neck works. <laughs> but, um, the, the, uh, but the other reason that cats do that is that while their neck is not broken, just like other old things, their joints start to get a little stiffer. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, like, you know, the, the act of scooping it up and licking it off of her paws instead of bending her neck down slightly is more comfortable because she's old. Yeah. Something you know, I've seen older cats do a lot of the time is that they'll like loaf in front of the bowl and do it that way. Yeah. Um, that's like an old cat thing that uh, my, the cat that I had when I was very young, um, you know, who I swear I've, I've experienced real prejudice because this cat hated the fact that I was born. <laughs> um, but the, uh, uh, she would do that in her old age and she died at like 18, something like that. Yeah. Um, but just, just something about like, I'm just eat, eating my lunch in the kitchen and I just see my cat shaking in front of the water bowl, slowly lifting her paw to lift, lick a little bit of water. I'm like, Oh, you poor thing. I mean, it's normal, but you poor thing. I want to hug you and squeeze you, but that would probably put you in so much joint pain. <laughs> Yeah, and I was thinking about you gonna let me pick you up. You're gonna let me? Nope. <laughs> he went. Nope. <laughs> he was. He was sitting like right over here, um, <laughs> and then I went to pick him up, and he was like, "No, no, nope." nope. <laughs> See, for him, the only time he want, or really wants to be picked up is if he's getting set in front of food or being set in a lap. Um, and this doesn't count as a lap. It has to be a proper lap, you know? <laughs> the, uh, um, but, uh, yeah, interesting thing. I, I took him into the vet today, um, and he was just fine in the Jeep. I found out the main reason why he hated being in the Jeep was the loud noises, and I figured out a way of making it quieter in there. Um, and except for, well, obviously, when it got up to full speed, it was kind of loud. But um, then he was fine. But then we get to the place, and there's just dogs everywhere. And he 
he just became this like little ball at the back of his cage. Oh God, my <laughs> blood pressure. And he just like I went and when I went to scoop him up and put him on the scale, like I literally, you know how you normally pick him up by you know get getting into the the uh, underneath their front paws, you know, right here for them. Um, and you know you get the hind legs and do it that way. Now I just like grabbed the ball. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was just like all the way scrunched in <laughs> he's having a fun day <laughs> um but uh yeah so is there anything else we want to uh mention before uh logging off not that i can think of nothing more about the john birch society or anything to to like uh, foreshadow about next week. We should cut down that tree before it gets any bigger. It's starting to get dangerous. <laughs> yes, Tyler, they are still around. Um, and if you want to see just like what is your standard reactionary take, you could go to the quartering, or you could go to them. They're they're the same thing. They're they're the Dennis Prager of their day. Yeah. Well, sometimes PragerU has like a novel approach, you know. But also, the thing about PragerU, uh, pr uh, not Dennis Prager in particular, but PragerU, is that they they're kind of like a trendsetter, you know. It's same thing with like. Uh, oh God, I don't want to give them any credit for something like that. But they are, um, you know, just as the John Birch Society was back in its day. Um, the you know, analogy they, holds. Say again. The analogy holds. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the uh, I definitely could see uh, Dennis Prager being. I mean, I I've actually seen a lot when I was doing my uh, political polarization series, um, and I started researching like um, right wing media and that because uh, Dennis Prager himself is is a uh, you know right wing radio host you know one of many obviously he's he's not top of the heap of that by any measure. Um, now everyone knows the modern day Father Coughlin is Ben Shapiro. Yeah, um, but uh, Ben Shapiro got his start in a very different way. Dennis Prager started as a as a. Uh, right-wing uh radio host you know he he was just trying to ape freaking michael savage and and uh the one that just recently that rush died. limbaugh rush limbaugh there we go you know he's just trying to be that um uh and if you look at early um prager you videos a lot of them are just like you know prager with like a camera pointing at his interviewee doing some sort of interview with with an academic of some sort um and it's like super shaky and and like really poor audio and all that kind of stuff like next to no graphics of any sort um you know it started off as just kind of a let's go to universities and do interviews much like I do on my show that's where the term Prager U actually starts. Not as like a, we're a university, but I'm Dennis Prager going to universities to talk to people. Like that was what the term started as. Um, obviously it morphed. You know, that's the thing, history, change over time. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, um, you could see that a lot of the uh, the movements of of uh, of especially the kind of conspiracism, you know, Glenn Beck is probably the most Birchian, um, the most Bircher of of all these like right wing media hosts. Um, although Infowars is an example too. Um, but, you know, it, it's the real conspiratorial part of it that makes it Birchian, you know? And that's the way it is.
Like, <laughs> wow, that's a that's pretty mean there, Matthew Hasley. <laughs> Matthew's regular on the show. He says, he says uh, from The Onion, fatal victim in car accident, tragically not Glenn Beck. <laughs> I, I like the, uh, oh, the the comedian who died recently that was on SNL. Um, why am I blanking on his name now? But uh, it, it, it's the meme where it's just a clip of whenever he was on the nightly news on SNL. And he's like, well, this may sound a little harsh, but I personally wish that everyone involved in this story would just die. <laughs> the uh, that actually like is, didn't Rush Limbaugh actually say something like that? Yeah, he would routinely mock. He would get the list of the most recent AIDS victims and just celebrate their death on his show. Yeah, and you wonder why people celebrated when he died. Yeah, I love how they're like, you're being monstrous. It's like, he was a monster. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I had somebody get real pissed off when I was like, when I said that, uh, when I retweeted the uh, thing of like Trump getting COVID and it was like just desserts. Um, and, you know, people are going, That's, yeah, you're not supposed to be that mean. And it's like, I literally just said just desserts. He's getting what he deserves. <laughs> um, you know that that turnabout is fair. Pro, uh, turnabout is that yeah. turnabout is fair play. You know. Um, and when you have that toxic of a personality, yeah, I don't. It's the same thing with like how, you know, the whole joke about like, what's the biggest uh, public urinal in the UK? Maggie's grave. <laughs> That's it. Only we could convert that into renewable energy. <laughs> the reason why pissing on my grave won't work is eventually you will run out of piss. I <laughs> uh, wonder, uh, wonder if there's a uh, way to turn... Uh, put a turbine on like abraham lincoln's body as it just spins <laughs> i mean we've got him we've got orwell we've got so many figures that we can convert into renewable energy with how much <laughs> they spend in the graves I mean, <laughs> forget nuclear power i mean <laughs> we've got abraham lincoln energy It's a popular British fantasy magic writer dies. I I have no idea. Oh, oh, JK. Mm. I, I was going to say, I'm like, but Terry Pratchett's already dead and beloved. What are you talking about? I thought he was, that she was, uh, that's Tyler, right? Yeah, uh, that she was referring to uh, that one British magician guy who uh like turned out to be a pedophile like a massive pedophile uh -huh. he was like a celebrated he was like the the mr rogers of britain jimmy savile yeah god if anything comes out about mr rogers i am just gonna say all right we're fucked i, I love There's... how we have to like make up stories about like how he was like this killer marine that did uh, you know and all that kind of stuff. It's like no, he never served. <laughs> no, no, you're thinking of Bob Ross. Bob Ross was the one who actually was in the military and he was a drill sergeant and he hated Bob Ross was a drill. <laughs> he was he was a drill sergeant during Vietnam and he hated the experience so much he vowed he would never yell again. Ah. That's why yes. he's always whispering. And he also hated his iconic afro being used to a military buzz cut. But he's like, all right, I'll do it for the kiddos. Being used to, what do you mean? Well, like he was in the military. Like, yeah. you know, he had he preferred yeah. shorter hair and his buzz cut and he kept it even like after the military until the show. When they're like, hey, you should like grow an afro. That would be quirky. And he really didn't want to. But he's like, all right, I'll oh. do it for the kids. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not that he hated being in the military. He just uh, well, he hated hate, yelling. Well, he well no, he did hate his experience in the military, but he did like, you know, still have a very like 
regimental lifestyle, shall we say? Mm. You know. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we all kind of. I mean, like I still wear a high and tight, right? Like, yeah. So high and tight. <laughs> oh, the, this this summer was so warm. I find like, all right, I'm gonna buzz my sides for the first time, and I'm like, I, oh my gosh, have I been missing this cool breeze around my head for this long? This is I, great. The only reason why I do a high and tight is that uh, is that like it's the most practical one. I, like I don't want to buzz my entire head all the time, but I do want to have short hair on the sides. It's just nice. Yeah. Um, so like I let this grow out until it's until I start having to comb it to the side, um, and the uh, like. Because if I comb it to the side, then I have to have like a part here, and that requires, you know, constantly working on it and all that kind of stuff. It's just annoying. Um, whereas it just naturally grows forward. Um, but the uh, the uh, um, it also requires combing, you know, and I don't want to comb. <laughs> like I just wake up like this, right? <laughs> yeah. The only thing I have to do in terms of hair right now is is shave here, you know, um, cut, uh, cut the the beard up to here, <laughs> um, and so I let everything grow, and then I will cut the sides until the top is too long in and of itself, um, and then I cut uh, and then I buzz everything. All right, so. Uh, We've been going for a while, and I've ran out of beer. <laughs> Man, let's wrap it up. So, um, guys, next uh, next week, you uh, are you available next week? Do you know? Um, yeah, you know, we can always change uh, it if not. Probably, most cool. likely. So, hopefully, next week. Not not making any promises, but next week uh, we will be coming together to watch the John Birch Society so, uh, movie called Anarchy in the USA. And this came out before Anarchy in the I UK. Am an, an, oh, okay. Did you know that the Sex Pistols actually made a a, 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 it's not Anarchy in the USA, it's Anarchy USA. Um, but did you know that the Sex Pistols actually made a version for the United States when they did the American tour? Doesn't surprise me. I knew they were corporate hacks. Yeah, well. I mean, they were. Yeah, quite literally. Punk is um, a lie, everyone. I mean, it, it's nice, but it's a lie. But, uh, I mean, if Sex Pistols is your standard, sure. <laughs> um, it's okay. It's It was founded on a lie, but it somehow got legit along the way. What? Ramones? Ramones predate the Sex Pistols by like half a decade. British punk started on a lie. But then, not also not by sure. that long. British punk started on a lie, but got legit along the way. Yeah, the uh, Sex Pistols were founded in like '78. Uh, Ramones are like '69, actually. It might actually be a whole decade. Um, but the uh, uh, and Ramones there's Ramones were '74. '74, right? Still half a decade. Um, but the. Uh, um, you know, there's also proto-punk stuff. Ramones are considered like the first punk band, basically because they personify everything that's punk. Um, you know, but uh, you know, you had like uh, we don't need to get into this punk. We we've had this like origins of punk conversation like five thousand times. I guess yeah. I, I just like punk. Um, the uh, anyways, um, they did do uh, the Sex Pistols when they did the American tour they uh they did uh anarchy in the usa but halfway through that tour the uh the ramones broke up and sid vicious took over as not wait not sid vicious the other one the other one with a cool name um anyways the guy uh another one of them uh took over and then he ended up shooting his girlfriend in the pro uh, during the tour and that like killed everything. Um, you know, murder tends to do that. <laughs> Johnny Rotten. Wait, no, wait, is Johnny Rotten the no Johnny Rotten was the first singer. Sid Vicious was the one who shot his uh girlfriend. 
you know, the funny thing is, in terms of uh, even though they were absolutely corporate sellouts, the way they lived their lives was gutter punk as hell. <laughs> like, they were absolute dropout losers living in like the worst conditions because they didn't ha know how to make a buck. Um, and like, just absolute, you know, the uh, punk, the term prior to a the music. Real motley crew. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, basically they were put together by, by uh, the, uh, fashion shop just called sex hence sex pistols. Um, but in basically every other way. Yeah. Now in terms of uh, like, if you listen to the lyrics of anarchy in the UK, they don't make sense. <laughs> it's it's like anarchy is like a you know. He rhymes anarchist with antichrist by saying anarchist. <laughs> yeah, uh, Johnny Rutten didn't know how to sing. He didn't know how to play guitar. Uh, Sid Vicious didn't know how to play the bass. Okay, maybe they were legit. Um, like yeah, they were put together by the by a corporation and and ran by it, but like. In their lives, they were very punk, <laughs> to the point of literally murder. <laughs> um, like their first, uh, their first, uh, um, like studio was a hideout that Johnny Rotten had been thrown into because the owner of the of the shop, um, like knew that he could use him and basically just threw him in a dilapidated old building and said like learn the guitar <laughs> like yeah, damn <laughs> yeah it it's they're actually a pretty fascinating story because uh they're not like they're not what you think of as punk when it comes to like ideology um but lifestyle yeah in terms of organization, they're like the first sellouts, you know? Um, but, like, selling out is part of punk, you know? <laughs> um, but, anyways, enough of all that. <laughs> we, I need to get another drink and get some dinner. Um, but, uh, um, do you think I'll be? No, I don't think I'll be doing um, anything uh, on Discord tonight. No, um, but anyways, uh, the uh, next time we'll be hopping on to talk about uh, uh, to talk about uh, Anarchy USA from the John Birch Society and how propaganda gets real insidious. Um, hope you guys liked it, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye now.